talk to about this temple. Uh, we're so glad you came back for the Lord's, the Lord's Day. Uh, looking forward to hearing some good preaching tonight uh, and worshiping the Lord through song and giving of our tithes and offerings again to Him. Uh, so so thankful for you all to be here. Let's go ahead and go to prayer. Uh, prayer. Um, uh, the, men are, the men are going to be coming down in just a moment, uh, but just to give a couple blessings, we've got uh, Brother Chris and uh, Miss Tisha Ferguson. They had their baby girl uh, just a couple days ago. Yes, amen. Amen. So looking forward to meeting her. But then also, if you could just pray for Pastor uh, Miss Sarah Zeraway. They're down south in Oklahoma in the promised land. Uh, they're preaching. Uh, Pastor, they, they're not preaching. Uh, just Pastor Sam's preaching uh, for his dad down there. Pastor John Waterloo at Central Baptist Church preaching their revival. Uh, so it starts today, tomorrow, uh, Tuesday, and Wednesday. So be in prayer for him uh, and the revival that takes place there uh, at their church. Uh, but then just thankful to be here. Amen. Uh, thankful to uh, be a part of this church, this local New Testament body, and looking forward to seeing what uh, God has to say to us tonight through His Word. Uh, but let's go ahead and go to prayer as the men come down. And uh, here in just a minute, we're going to have John Clark come up, and he's going to read uh, the call to worship as we focus on this theme, lifting up our wonderful God. So let's go ahead, Lord, in prayer and ask Him to join us for the service tonight. Father, we thank You so much for the time that You've given to us uh, to to spend the whole day with You, uh, Lord, to to listen, to sit at your feet, as Mary did, Lord, to sit at your feet and to learn of you. Lord, would you help us tonight uh, to cling on to every word that what you say to us. Lord, may we take it with us this week as we go back into the workforce, as we go back into the world, as we go back into our mission field, Father. Lord, I pray that you'd help us, Lord, to keep um, our real job at our focus this week. Lord, there's going to be so many things. We, do, we know what's coming. Uh, we know Monday is coming. We know that... Um, Things are going to try to come in and distract and come in and discourage to come in to uh, take away what you have planted in their hearts and lives. But Lord, I pray that you'd give us grace. Uh, would you give us the power and the ability to withstand temptation? Would you help us, Lord, to keep our eyes upon you this week, to, to see souls as, as you see souls? Uh, help us to view people as you do. Help us to love them. Uh, but Lord, I pray that you'd be with us for the next few moments, Lord, as we lift up our praises to you, as we worship you, as we thank you for who you are in our life. And as we give our tithes and offerings to you, as we respond to your word, even Lord, I pray that you'd be glorified tonight. Uh, everything tonight would be for you uh, and for the building up of this place. We love you in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Brother John, you come. Our call to worship tonight comes from Psalm 116, verse 12, and Psalm 103, verses 1 through 2, which read, what shall I render unto the Lord for all his benefits toward me? Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits.
Amen. Let's stand together, shall we? We're singing three hymns back to back, 54, 55, 56. To God be the glory. We'll start up with that one. Number 54, to God be the glory. Two. To God be the glory. To God be the glory. To God be the glory for the things he had done with his blood he has saved me with his power he has raised me to God be the glory for the things he has done bless his holy name bless the lord oh my soul and all that is within me bless his holy name bless the lord Oh, my soul and all that is within me, bless his holy name. He has done great things. He has done great things. He has done great things. Bless his holy name. Let's up, bless the Lord. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, 
and all that is within me bless his holy name to god be the glory to god be the glory great things he had done so loved he the world that he gave us his son who yielded his life and atonement for sin and opened the life gate that all may go in praise the lord praise the lord let the earth hear his voice praise the lord praise the lord let the people rejoice oh come to the father through jesus the son and give him the glory great things he hath done oh perfect redemption the purchase of blood to every believer the promise of god the vilest defender who truly believes that moment on jesus a pardon receives praise the lord praise the lord let the earth hear his voice praise the lord praise the lord let the people rejoice oh come to the father through jesus the son and give him the glory let's sing it out on last great things he had taught us great things he had done and great our rejoicing through jesus the son but purer and higher and greater will be our wonder our transport when jesus we see praise the lord praise the lord let the earth hear his voice praise the lord praise the lord let the people rejoice oh come to the father through jesus the son and give him the glory great things he had done amen thank you for your good singing you may be seated Just one thing I crave To sit at the feet of my Lord Riches that cannot be taken away I drink in His mercy And peace is restored Yes, one thing that one thing is Jesus, to know Him, and in Him be found. One thing, I count all things lost for that one priceless treasure I see. to me one thing is needful one thing I desire to dwell in the house of my Lord to gaze 
on his beauty and burn with his fire to stand in his presence where grace is outpoured yes one thing that one thing is jesus to know him and in him be found one thing i count all things lost for that one priceless treasure i see One thing is needful, this one thing I do. I press toward the mark of my Lord. To know Him in power, in sufferings too. Forgetting things past, reaching toward my reward. Yes, one. That one thing is Jesus, to know Him, and in Him be found. One thing, I count all things lost for that one priceless treasure I see. That one thing is Jesus to me. Open your Bibles tonight to Psalm 141. That was such a beautiful song, and even with all of its beauty and just the way that she sang it, it's so convicting at the same time. Just is that always that one thing that we want? Is that always what we desire? And uh, just very, very convicting, and yet sung so beautifully. And so, thank you, Mrs. Forrest, for that. Um, I pray that tonight, as a I'd like to be an encouragement tonight and just uh, get into a, a psalm, Psalm 141. I've really enjoyed, uh, just to, to echo some of what the song said there, I've really enjoyed going with Pastor Sam through Matthew because at the same time in the Bible study, we're going through the book of John. And so spending all that time learning about Jesus and how he reacted to things has really just started to really impress on my heart. It's just that what she was talking about, learning of him and learning about him, and learning how he reacted, and trying to mold my life to that, and I come up short daily, <laughs> um, but trying to get closer and closer, and I love what Pastor Sam has been going through, but wasn't revival just such a blessing? Um, I just, uh, Pastor Humber is one of my fathers in the ministry, there's no other way to say it, is he's just, he's always been there for me, and a lot of my rough times, all the way through some of my highest victories, and he's just always been there and consistently. I, I loved it on last Sunday night when he said, tonight is the convicting message. The rest of them are going to be encouraging. And even in his encouragement, he finds a way to really just stick it to me every night. And so we were able to, uh, we were here Monday night and got to be here for those services, and then we watched live stream on Tuesday and Wednesday to just keep up with all of you. And so I just was so encouraged by everything that Pastor Humbert said, just the, the direction that the church is going now, but then with Pastor Humbert giving that revival, just the momentum that we can have as a church moving forward into this summertime. And people are excited about it. Even just being up in Wheeling, we've, we've been trying to you know, get a lot more people into the Bible study and everything. And just talking to people yesterday, we were just relaxing at the lake. We went out on our little kayak. And I was packing up the kayak, and I, I, I mean, I'm just packing up the kayak. I'm not out to soul win. 
I had five different people just stop and start talking to me, and I was able to talk to them through that. It's just, it, people are excited to be outside and to be talking and to have life again. And those are all opportunities for us to do our real job, as Pastor Humbert said. And so it's just been exciting to be a part of that. And tonight I want to be an encouragement and something that has always popped up in my life. Every time that I've had, I think I can say that every time that I've had a mountaintop, pretty much right afterwards, there's either a plateau or there's a trial. One or the other. And I think in this passage tonight, we find something from David that is, that is similar. And so I want to dig into it tonight. So if you're with me tonight in Psalm chapter 141, Psalm 141, and we'll start there in verse 1. The Bible says, Lord, I cry unto Thee, make haste unto me, and give ear unto my voice when I cry unto Thee. Let my prayer be set forth before Thee as incense, as the lifting up of my hands, as the evening sacrifice. Set a watch, O Lord, before my mouth. Keep the door of my lips. Incline not my heart to any evil thing to practice wicked works with men that work iniquity. And let me not eat of their dainties. Let the righteous smite me. It shall be a kindness. And let him reprove me. It shall be an excellent oil which shall not break my head. For yet my prayer also shall be in their calamities. When their judges are overthrown in stony places, they shall hear my words for they are sweet. Our bones are scattered at the grave's mouth, as, with one, as when one cutteth and cleaveth wood upon the earth. But mine eyes are unto thee, O God, the Lord. In thee is my trust. Leave not my soul destitute. Keep me from the snares which they have laid for me, and the gins of the workers of iniquity. Let the wicked fall into their own nets, whilst that I withal escape. Let's pray tonight, and we'll get into the message. Dear Lord, I thank you so much for this week. For the excitement of revival, Lord, being right after Easter Sunday, Lord, and just the uh, excitement it was just to have nice weather, Lord, and it may be dreary today, but Lord, we have you in the midst with us today. And I pray, Lord, that you just help us tonight and get us excited about your word and get us encouraged about your word, Lord. And I pray, Lord, that you just be with us tonight, Lord, that you would be here and be with us and make your presence known. We love you, Lord. We thank you for all you do for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, this psalm is a hard one to place a date or time on. There's many different commentators that have many different ideas of where it came from. Some say that it was while he was fleeing. It was David that wrote it. Some say it was while he was fleeing from Saul. And some say that it was while he was fleeing from Absalom. Some say that it was during a time of prosperity. And some say that it was during a time of great want. And all of them are kind of all over the map, but the general census is we don't know exactly when it was written, but what we do know is that from the study, I believe that this was written in a time when David was anticipating something, anticipating a trial, anticipating an enemy. Maybe he knew of an enemy that was coming, maybe he didn't, but he was in anticipation of a trial that was about to come to him. And in anticipation of this trial, David cries out to God for deliverance, as we see him do so many times in the Psalms. So David's tone in verse number one suggests an urgent need for divine intervention. He wanted God's attention. And so tonight, just right off the bat, when was the last time we cried out desperately for God's attention? Now, I called myself on the carpet on this one, because a lot of times I'll pray when I'm in the car, I'll pray when I'm at work, and I'll pray different times, but when do we really get it into our minds that I want God to have my attention so much that I'm literally going to cry out to Him. I've heard stories of people that literally weep and cry as loud as they possibly can to the Lord because they want, they desperately want the Lord's intervention in a situation. When was the last time we literally cried out to God? When was the last time that we begged God to intervene in our, in our uh, circumstances? I think of uh, at New Heights when we were in Texas. We had a lady, Miss Becca, and um, her husband got COVID and she was taking care of her husband. And right after, he was right about to come out of it, and she got COVID and she got it so bad that we were planning her funeral. I mean, it was, it was bad. And it, and it came so fast. And I can remember there was a Saturday that I was, I was working and Pastor... Foster there, he called and he said, all right, church, we need to get together and we need to pray for this dear lady. And I don't know if I've heard a group of people 
plead with the Lord like I did that day. And yet at the same time, during their plead, they were saying, Lord, if it's your will, we want your will to be done. We love this woman and we desperately want her to to continue with us, to be with us for, for a lot longer. She's a younger lady. She's maybe in her late 30s. Not that old. And she and they pleading with the Lord and they were just crying out. And I remember just being in tears as everyone was in that room. And we were pleading for the Lord to intervene on our, per, on, on our behalf. And that day, eerie, almost eerie if it wasn't for the fact that we know what kind of God we serve. The hour we were praying, the doctor said, we can't explain it. She turned around. Literally the hour we were praying. And I've never experienced anything like it in my whole life. But God's people pleading earnestly and desperately for some intervention from their Lord. So what was so important to David at this time in his life that he pleaded with God to hear his cry? Well, let's start to get into it. I have a couple points tonight, and there's going to be a couple points of application as we go through it. And so what we're going to start here with is, if we want to keep the excitement and the fire of revival, because if we're talking about mountaintop experiences, revival's got to be one of those throughout the year. Once a year we get together and we, we block out that chunk of time and we just devote it to God and we get closer to God. We listen to His Word brought to us from phenomenal preachers every year. And we block that out for God and we focus on growth. And so if we want to keep that spirit, if we want to continue to grow, if we want to protect that spirit, that fire of revival, prayer should be a constant thing in our lives. Verse number two. Let my prayer set be set before thee as incense and the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. David wanted his prayers to be as frequent as incense was burned in the temple. In Exodus 30, verses 7 and 8, it says, And Aaron shall burn thereon sweet incense every morning when he dresseth the lamps. He shall burn incense upon it. And when Aaron lighteth the lamps, even he shall burn incense upon it, a perpetual incense before the Lord throughout your generations. So the idea of the incense was they'd burn it in the morning, they'd pray to the Lord, they'd worship the Lord in the morning as they were lighting the incense, and it would burn throughout the day for a good chunk of time. And then at evening, about 3 o'clock, right around the same time that they would do the evening sacrifice, at right around 3 o'clock, they'd light the evening incense. And that would burn throughout the night. The idea was, was a protection for the people all the day. It was an incense to the Lord to, to, um, for the Lord to protect them, to keep them safe. The incense was to be burned perpetually. So David, in saying this, is desiring that his prayer would be as perpetual as the incense was. Every day, every morning, every night, the incense was burning throughout the day. And just as that incense was throughout the day and perpetually from generation to generation, he also wanted his cry before the Lord, his prayer before the Lord, to be perpetual, to be continual and continuing on. And so then he continues there at the end, and the lifting up my hands is the evening sacrifice. Every day there was a morning and an evening sacrifice as well. A set-aside time for Israel, not an individual, not each individual person, but this was a set-aside time that Israel would, uh, they would calendar their whole day around it. Their whole day was scheduled around the morning and the evening sacrifice, where they would wake up, they would all get together, they would go and they would look towards the tabernacle, the morning sacrifice smoke would rise up and they would worship the Lord together as a nation. It wasn't an individual thing, it was a national thing. They would do it together. And around 3 p.m. they would offer the last sacrificial lamb for the atonement of the sins of the people for the day. In Exodus 29, 38 it says, Now this is that which thou shalt offer upon the altar, two lambs of the first year, day by day, continually. The one lamb shalt thou offer in the morning, and the other lamb shalt thou offer at even. And with the one lamb, a tenth deal with the fourth part and hin of beaten oil and the fourth part of an hin of wine for a drink offering. And the other lamb, the night offering, thou shalt offer at even and shalt do thereunto according to the meat offering of the morning and according to the drink offering thereof. For a sweet savor, an offering made by fire unto the Lord. This shall be a continual burnt offering 
throughout your generations at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation before the Lord, where I will meet with you to speak there unto thee. So you can see how he's kind of tied these sacrifices and the incense. He's tying in, he wants perpetual prayer. He wants prayer that's going to be like a sacrifice, a sweet smelling savor to the Lord that's pleasing to the Lord that David is crying out to him. And you also see with the sacrifices, they were heavily dependent upon the Lord in those sacrifices and relying on God. And that's what David wants his prayer to be. Not a prayer of, Lord, I want, I want, I want. Lord, I'm in total dependence on you. I am in total dependence on you. And I want to constantly be in contact with you. Perpetually. So this was a daily routine that the Israelites would do here at the beginning and the end of the day. They'd start with the sacrifice and burn that incense throughout the day. And at the end of the day, they'd end it with the sacrifice again. He wanted this perpetual prayer. Every day, it was so effective and fervent that it was just as the sweet-smelling savor of the sacrifices. What a powerful... I, I, you got to love the Psalms and how powerful David's wording is. Because it's just such a beautiful picture of the way that our prayer life is supposed to be. It's supposed to be consistent and continual all the time. And yet, how often do we get into a situation and we're flustered and we're frustrated? Why is that? Because we're not in contact with the one who gives us the solutions. We need that. If we want to continue in the decisions we made during revival, if we want to continue in that, prayer has got to be a constant mainstay in our lives. We need that contact with God. It goes without saying that that goes right with Bible reading. We need to hear from God out of His Word, and we need to speak to Him through prayer consistently and continually. This is a prayer life that is not just consistent or specific prayer time. It's an in-depth conversation with God that is talking, pleading, and petitioning. Whatever the situation, constant prayer is being made. Prayer for assistance, help, advice, to just talk, to praise, and inspect, to even ask, not question God, but question, God, why is this happening? When you look at David's prayers, they range all, all of the above. They go from, Lord, why, why do the wicked prosper? Is he questioning God or God's goodness or his righteousness? No, he's just asking God, God, I, I need to bring it to you. I don't understand. And many times David answers and says, but you're still good. You're still on the throne. You're still high and holy. I may not understand everything about what happens with the wicked man, but I know that you're holy. I know that you're good. But we're not going to grow in that. We're not going to see past what we can see in the physical. As in, uh, We're not going to see why the people that are wicked prosper so well. Why is it that all these wicked men have everything we could ever want, and yet we're struggling? Lord, we're, we're doing what you want us to do. Why is it that... All the time we put those blinders on and we look at just the physical things of this world. Well, if we're talking to God, He helps us see past that and see, you know what, God? You're sovereign over all of it. You're sovereign over everything. James 15, 6, uh, 5, 16b says, Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Pray without ceasing. I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. 1 Timothy 2.8 Prayer is something that is so essential, and we say it so often. And yet, how often is it consistent and continual? All the time. Praying without ceasing. Praying all the time. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. A.W. Tozer said this. Two quotes from him. The true success of any church is going to be prayer. We can easily deceive ourselves, but our purity, our power, and our spirituality, and our holiness will parallel our prayer. So think about that. Our purity, our power, and our spirituality, and our holiness will only parallel our prayer. If we're not praying to back up those things, it's not going to have any power behind it. He said a second one, I think we ought to spend time in prayer waiting before God seeking Him. I think we ought to drop off some things that we are doing that are perfectly normal and right and though not harmful are keeping us from prayer. <clears throat> I'm sorry, I lost my spot. 
The Lord wants us, David is pleading with the Lord here. He says, Lord, I, I'm, not, I'm praying, so think about this. He's praying to God, but he said, on top of the fact that I'm praying to you, Lord, let me continue to pray to you all the time. Let me consistently pray to you. He's asking God for the help and the grace to continue in that type of prayer. If we want to keep the fire of revival, consistent, fervent prayer is a must. Second, if we want to keep the fire of revival, we need to watch what we say and what we, uh, what we say with our mouth. He says there in verse number three, Set a watch, O Lord, before my mouth. Keep the door of my lips. Now, you can ask my wife. I struggle with this on a daily basis. Not that I'm saying bad stuff, but that I just don't watch what's coming out of my mouth. I speak before I think about it, and a lot of times I'll say something that isn't intending to be insulting, and yet it hurts my wife's feelings. Why is that? Because I'm not watching what I'm saying. Now, that's a simple thing, but we could go as far as to the ends of you're talking with somebody in the workplace, and because you're not guarding your mouth, you're not guarding the filter in which you, you speak through, you're not guarding it, you start saying things with your coworkers that you'd never say here at church, that you'd never say even in your own house, that you'd never say. You, you say things, we just let it loose. How often do we pray, God, protect my mouth. Protect what I say. Be with the words I say today. And it's not just bad things we could say, sinful things we could say. It's also, Lord, guard my mouth. I don't want to say anything that brings dishonor to you. Because I could be out talking with somebody, and I, I, I put it later in the notes, but I was out even yesterday, and I was talking with my coworker, one of my coworkers, and he said, have you ever drink beer? And I said, no, I've, I've never touched it, never touched it. And he's like, have you ever thought about touching it? It, it tastes good. And I said, no, I've, I've never, never done that. I said, I believe in the Bible that it's wrong. And I started with that. But what I wasn't paying attention to is that I also said after that, I said, yeah, everyone in my family, uh, usually if they, if they get into that stuff, they're raging drunks or they're, they're drug addicts or they're, you know, alcoholics. They go head deep. He goes, oh, so that's why you don't. So that's why you don't do it. I said, no, 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 no. It's because I believe it's wrong in the Bible. I was just giving it supplemental things. But if I'm not watching it, even something like that, oh, so you don't drink because your family history. No, 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 that's not my reason at all for what I'm doing. But because I wasn't being careful, I said, no, no, no. And so I had to come back and say, no, 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 no. I believe it's wrong in the Bible. And I had to stand on that truth. If we don't guard our mouth, we'll end up saying things that we never intended to say, things like that. And so how often do we pray, as David is here, Lord, keep the door of my lips. How often have we heard our moms or anybody else for that matter say, if you have nothing good to say, don't say anything at all. If you have nothing good to say, don't say anything at all. The old rhyme goes, a wise old owl sat on an oak. The more he saw, the less he spoke. The less he spoke, the more you heard. Why can't we all be like that wise old bird? Sometimes silence is better than just running your mouth. Sometimes it's better to just not say anything. During my internship in Texas, while I was in college, I was able to have an afternoon lunch where... I sat with three current pastors, two of which I was working closely with and another pastor from the area, and four retired pastors. And it was, it was the uh, you know, wisdom box of the century, just getting to pick their brains. And these older pastors are sitting there and we're asking a bunch of questions. And so one of the pastors stopped and said, if you could have one thing that you could tell these young guys that would have changed your life as a young pastor, what would it be? And all four of them looked at each other and they kind of smiled and the one spoke up and he said, just listen. Just listen. You don't have to talk. He said, there are a lot of situations in the church that I could have fixed by just listening. He goes, don't have an answer for everything. He goes, doctrinally, yes, have an answer for everything. But sometimes you need to just not speak. And so he said, a lot of younger people, and I respected him for what he said to us, a lot of younger people, you just start talking. And you keep talking until you find the solution. Sometimes it's best to just not speak. You won't put your foot in your mouth as much. Sometimes it's best to just not speak. 
He said, uh, you don't have to talk. Talking is when we get into trouble. Listen, just let God speak and give people what he gives you, not whatever's coming off the top of your head. This translates to all facets of speech. Uh, You could go into cursing, lying, talking too much, talking like a fool without understanding, running your mouth. Um, Jesus said there in Matthew 12, 34, for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. What is in your heart will come out. I, I had an illustration one time with the kids when I was out in kids' summer church. And I told them, I said, look at these two sponges. A lot of times as Christians, we like to think, oh, well, I'm in church every Sunday. I, I look fine on the outside. And sometimes even in those sponges, the sponges can look clean. And I said to the kids, I said, look at these two sponges. Are they both clean? And they're like, yeah. One had water in it. And what they didn't know was the other had vinegar in it. And I said, why don't you smell this? And as soon as I squeezed it, and that came out, they went, oh, <laughs> they're like, oh, the smell of vinegar just, just overwhelming. So we can look good on the inside, but when the pressures really come, it, sometimes it stinks. And the point was to illustrate this. We can look good on the outside, but in private, in, in hushed tones under our breath, when nobody else is around, God still hears it. God still knows what's coming out of our mouth. And if we're not being careful, we're not watching our mouth, we're maybe saying things under our breath, saying things when we're caught in traffic and people are driving like maniacs, saying all these different things, it can catch us. And what's in our heart will come out, and that leads right into the next verse. David says there in verse 4, Incline not my heart to any evil thing, to practice, practice wicked works with men that work iniquity, and let me not eat of their dainties. If we want to keep the fire of revival, we need to guard our hearts from wicked thoughts and deeds. Again, When all we're pumping into our hearts and minds is the world, that's what's going to come out. And I mean, Pastor Humbert did an excellent job of just talking about many different facets of our Christian life, but about keeping our job, our focus, rather than what's on TV, rather than what's on everything else. That's why teen camp, revival, preachers meetings, and other activities heavily focused on preaching are so effective because it forces us out of the world and into God's Word. It forces us out of our time of, okay, you don't, if you want to be at Revival tonight, you don't have time to watch your TV show. You don't have time to do anything else. It forces you out of your comfort zone, if you will, and gets you into the the house of God under God's Word, and it forces you to be constantly in the Word of God. It forces you in times like Revival and Teen Camp and all those other things. So if all we're ever pumping in is the world, that's what's going to come out. There, there are times where I honestly think, man, I, I, feel like, I feel like I just want revival all the time. Like I want these preachers meetings all the time. Like I feel like I could be in God's house every single day if I could. And yet with the technical, technological revolution, you can listen to endless amount of sermons online if you want to. We can listen to that stuff. We can read in our Bible and get just as much out of our Bible reading as we do from whoever's speaking from behind the pulpit. That's not to excuse the, forsake the assembling of yourselves together. That's just to say, listen, if we're diving into this the way that we ought to, we're going to get what we need out of it. And if we're here under the teaching and preaching of Pastor Sam and the staff here at the church, we're going to get what God needs for us. He's going to use the preacher to speak directly to us. You know, I I like TV and movies just as much as everybody else, and you can barely get anything clean anymore, but I like it. But if all I'm ingesting is worldly shows, even if they're clean by our standards, even if they're clean, even if they're not, we're still going to get ideas from those movies and TV shows. Rather than getting our ideas and our thoughts and our intentions and our motivations out of God's Word, It's a dangerous spot to be in. We need to get that out of God's Word rather than out of weekly entertainment. The devil uses a lot of these things to kind of excuse our sin, to kind of trick us into thinking, well, you know, I mean, and we've heard it a million times, we need some me time. Well, our me time could be found in the Bible just as much as it can be found in a TV show. And. We get a lot of preaching on wickedness of thoughts and actions, but how often do we plea with God when we're in a good spot? 
when we're in a good time, when we're in a time after revival where we're, where we're feeling okay, we're feeling pretty right with God, how often do we plead, Lord, protect me? Desperately pleading with God, protect me from those sins that I don't even see that are just around the corner. Protect me from that thought or that deed. How often do we plead with God to protect us on a daily basis from the influences of our lives? Because as much as I like to feel like I'm an amazing influence, if I'm not careful at work, my coworkers can be an influence on me. And your coworkers and everybody around us can start to influence a culture. You could go into a rabbit hole on how culture can subtly influence you throughout your life and us not even see it. How often do we plead with God, please protect me from this stuff? We repent, but are we proactive in prayer to allow, allow God to grow us and protect us before we struggle? Because we will struggle. There will be times when we struggle. And when we do struggle, I think of what my friend Colt said. He, he uh, got asked when he was working one time at the church, and he, he, a guy came up to him and said, hey, how are you doing on your devotions? And he said, to be honest with you, I'm struggling. And the man said to him, well, keep struggling. That means you're fighting for it. If you're struggling, that means you're trying to continue to do it. So even in the struggle, we can keep fighting. We keep struggling. That means that you're trying to do good. Keep struggling. We're good at asking for forgiveness, and we do good once we are shown our sin, but how often do we ask for a guard for protection against the inclination towards sin, against the desire to sin? David said, Lord, don't allow me to pleasure myself in this sin the way that they do. And he says, don't let me, at the end of that verse there, let me not eat of their dainties. They paint it so well. Like my, my friend that was at work yesterday, and he said to me, you know, isn't it, isn't it funny that the things that are worse for you taste so good? And I'm like, no, it doesn't taste good. It stinks. Like, that, that's my opinion. It, no, I, I can't afford to think that. And David's saying here, let me not even look at the things that they say are sweet and good as that. Let me, just, let me just stay completely away from that. Don't allow me to pleasure in myself and sin the way that they do. Lord, keep me from wickedness of thought, action, and the influence of wicked men. Fourthly there, if we want to keep the fire of revival, this is a big one. Lord, train me to gracefully accept reproof. And this one hurts because it hurts our pride. Verse number five. <coughs> Let the righteous smite me, it shall be a kindness. Let's just stop there. That doesn't sound good. <laughs> that doesn't sound like a kindness. He says there, this is a big one, we can accept preaching and even teaching, but when someone personally comes to you and says, look, brother or sister, I see something that I think is an issue. What is our tendency? My tendency is to be back off, man. Let me deal with it myself. Yet how often do we gracefully accept reproof? Let alone pray to the Lord, Lord, help me if someone reproves me. If someone rebukes me, Lord, help me to take it gracefully. He says, let the righteous smite me. I, I've never prayed that. Let the righteous smite me. This request sounds ridiculous to us because we don't like reproof. He's asking the Lord to allow the righteous to strike him down so that he might repent of those sins. You know, there are plenty of sins that I have been blissfully ignorant of until someone comes up and says, hey, stop it. Pastor Humbert is a perfect example of that. I've had many times in his office, especially when I was an intern, where he said, hey, you're being dumb. You need to cut it out. I need that in my life, and we all need that, but at the same time, how often when someone comes up and says, hey, this is a concern, in a heart of love. And that's what he's talking about. He's not talking about someone who's coming up and saying, hey, you're, you're dumb. You need to fix this. And not doing it in a heart of hate or a heart of just trying to be better than you. He's talking about someone who comes up in love and says, hey, this is an issue. We need to, can I help you with this? Is there anything I can do to help you fix this? Is This is just something that I've seen, a habit or something that I've seen, he's asking the Lord to allow these people to strike him down in his heart so that he might repent 
And he follows it with, it shall be a kindness. Now, if you truly love someone in the Lord, you're going to reprove them. Again, out of a heart of love, out of a heart of trying to restore that person, you'll say, hey, this is an issue. Can I, can I help you with this? Is there anything I can do with this? And our job when we receive that is to not be like, back off. Our job is to somehow find it, to knock down our pride and say, hey, actually, I've been struggling with this. Hey, actually, I, I, I didn't even recognize that that was a habit that I had that was sinful. He said, in love and in the spirit of reproof and rebuke, those are vital to our growth in Christ because people will point out things that we don't want to face ourselves. If people can't ever approach you with anything, you probably have an issue of not receiving reproof and rebuke the right way. If people feel like they can't approach you about stuff, if, if, your, spouse and, if your spouse feels like they can't approach you about things and say, hey, Sweetheart, you've been biting lately. Hey, 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 Nick, like my wife. Hey, Nick, have you been doing all right in your devotions? You seem a little on edge lately. Hey, how is how has this aspect of your life been? How is this aspect? And what's our what's our initial response every time? Let's just put up the, the shield. Let's just defend ourselves and just but I'm I'm doing fine. I'm okay. I'll figure it out. When these people are bringing something to your attention to say, hey, I love you. I'm not trying to hurt you. I'm trying to help you in the Lord. He says, let him reprove me. It shall be an excellent oil. Allow the righteous, the courage, allow this man, whoever it is that would reprove you, the courage and strength to reprove me. Because it takes some boldness to walk up to someone and say, hey, I see some sin in your life. Because we know that people are going to put up the defenses. It shall be an excellent oil. Though it hurts and it may not be comfortable, godly reproof, full of grace and wisdom, can be used of God to correct you for the perfecting of the saints. The anointing of the head with oil was not only for the next king. That wasn't the only time that anointing was used in the Old Testament. It was also used as a blessing. When someone would come into your house if you wanted to pour a blessing upon them, you'd anoint their head with oil in the old times. And so David is using that picture for the Israelites to say, for, for people to say, allow the reproof and rebuke to be a blessing upon me. We view it as someone injuring us when they bring up something like that. But David's saying, allow it to be like that oil, that it's a blessing. It's a refreshment to my soul to be rebuked by God's saints. The heaviness of reproof will come down on my head, but it will not break it. That's what he's saying there, by my head will not be broken. Let me accept reproof so much that even in, he, he changes ideas here a little bit at the end of verse 5. He says, for yet my prayer also shall be in their calamities. Now, is he talking about the righteous? No, he's, he's switched now. And he pairs verse 5 and 6 together. He says, For yet my prayer also shall be in their calamities. When their judges are overthrown in stony places, they shall hear my words, for they are sweet. He's talking now about his enemies. He switched gears and he says, Lord, let my prayer, let me be rebuked so much, be so humbled that when my enemy is in their calamity, I pray for him. So much so that when their judges are overthrown, they shall hear my words, for they are sweet. How often has it been that you've talked to someone who is a wicked person, and you know they're a wicked person, and they instantly think that you hate them just because we have opposing thoughts? They instantly think that we hate them. Wicked people, Jesus said that the world will hate us because we stand for him. He said that. And so often what they'll do is they will project their hatred of us on us as if we hate them back. So, what David's trying to get across here is, let me accept this reproof so much that I will be humbled to the fact that when I, my enemy, suffers some kind of affliction and I pray for him, he'll say, holy cow, that is so nice. That is so nice. My words will be sweet to them. Why is that? Because the righteous the righteous person praying for an unrighteous person is foreign to them because all they want is ill towards you. If all they want is ill towards you, when you pray for them, they'll, think, they'll be like, whoa, 
that's different. And that can be a testimony. And they'll say, wow, you're, I've been nothing but mean to you. Why are you praying for me? I can't tell you the amount of coworkers over the years of working at the bank job and many other places where they've told me something that they've struggling with. And I'll be like, hey, man, I'll pray for you. And they're, they literally look at me and they're like, you're going to pray for me? I don't even believe in God. I had one, one man say one time, he goes, dude, I, I'm an atheist. I said, I don't care. I'm still going to pray for you. I said, I, I believe that God can fix all of life's issues, all of life's problems. So I'm going to petition him for, for you that, that your situation will work out all right. And he just kind of looked at me and he's like, well, thanks. That's, that's different. When you're humbled to the extent that you allow somebody to say, hey, that's wrong, you need to fix it. When you're humbled that much, you'll be in a state of mind where you can pray for your enemies, where you can pray for those that are uh, wicked, and it'll be a testimony to them. They think, why, why would you pray for me? And that can be a testimony. Sixth, if we want to keep the fire of revival, Lord, let me only trust in you, verses 8 through 10. But mine eyes are unto thee, O God, the Lord, in thee is my trust. Leave not my soul destitute. Keep me from the snares of which they have laid for me and the gins of the workers of iniquity. Let the wicked fall into their own nets whilst that I withal escape. Regardless of our circumstances, Lord, I want to keep my eyes on you. That's what he's trying to say. Lord, God, God must be our trust. One of the biggest things that Pastor Humber has ever taught me was through many counseling sessions, many times of talking on the phone while I was at college, and even now as I send out my prayer letters, our prayer letters each month, Pastor Humber will email back and forth with me a little bit. Many times he said, hey, if what I'm saying does not line up with the Bible, don't believe in what I say because I'm going to fail you. We can't put our trust in man. And it's such a, such a hard thing in this generation. It seems like a lot of my generation seems to trust in man. And when man fails them one time, instantly they say, oh, he's a hypocrite. But our faith needs to be rooted and grounded in God, not in a man. It needs to be grounded in this book. And if God is our faith and our trust, if our faith is grounded in Him, He will preserve us. He says, mine eyes are unto thee, O Lord, in thee is my trust. Leave not my soul destitute. Lord, if you're my whole trust, you're not going to leave me wanting. Spiritually, physically, it doesn't matter. You're not going to leave me wanting. When we trust in our God, He is our strength and He will never leave us destitute. Protect us from the wicked one's traps. There, there's traps all over the place. The, the wicked one, the, the Satan, the devil, it tries to trip us up daily. And yet at the same time, He's got His workers all around us trying to trip us up daily. We need to be protected from those things. And Lord... Justice is yours. Allow them to fall in their own traps. That's what he says. I don't have to worry about it because guess what? Lord, you're taking care of it. Allow them to fall into their own traps. Now summarizing it all together, this prayerful psalm was written to prepare David's heart before a great trial. So coming off of a mountaintop type experience, like the revival we just came through, can often lead to some kind of difficult trial. Uh, many times in my life, this, is, this has been true. Uh, I was able to, in high school, many of you know we were able to go on a missions trip to Budapest, Hungary with Brother Peters. I still am in contact with Brother Peters. Every time he sees me, he gives me the biggest hug I've ever had of any person ever. And he loves on me every time I see him, and his sweet wife loves on me too. I love that couple. I was there in Hungary we did the baseball camp. We saw many kids saved. It was definitely what I would call a mountaintop experience in my Christian life. And immediately after, I've told the story many times, immediately after we get back that summer from, from that, we start handing out flyers for Awana, and I got hit by a car. I got hit by a car. And many of you know the story. I was hit by the car as it, as it blew through a stop sign, and nothing was wrong with me. And you'd think that that would get something through my thick skull that God is protecting me, that I was hit, struck by a car, and nothing happened. And yet I took that time in my life. I had a mountaintop experience. I had a trial come my way. And all I could say is, God, why would you do this to me? Now what happened to me? Nothing. 
Nothing happened. I walked away. I apologized to the lady that hit me in her car. I walked away with a few pieces of asphalt in my arms, and that was it. No broken bones. My head dented in her windshield. It didn't shatter it. Nothing. I could have walked away from that looking at what a miracle God did in protecting and preserving my life. And what I did was instead got angry at God. I failed that test. I failed it. There were other times when I was called to church plant. I remember my freshman year, I was on fire at school. I was, we just came off of the church planners conference. I was in my devotions more faithfully than I'd ever been in my whole life. And I was really feeling the Lord start to work in my heart. And just before spring break, I remember saying, Lord, I know that you've called me to church plant. I want to surrender to that. I get home for spring break. Tax time hits. And through an error of mine on my previous taxes, I owed $6,000 in taxes. As a young man in college, mom and dad remember this well. Boom. That'll smack you around a little bit. That's a trial. And the Lord was able to, in that trial, preserve me. I was able to have the right attitude and come out on the other side stronger for it. What am I saying here? I'm saying that oftentimes after mountaintop experiences, after times where we get our heart right with God, there's a trial that comes right afterwards. God allows us to go through something. And what we cannot do as Christians is sit idle. We can't get to that mountaintop and say, time to coast for a bit. This has been great. I'm doing good with God. It's time for me to just continue where I'm at. And we don't grow. We can't afford to do that. What David's pleading for here is not just, Lord, just simply deliver me. He's saying, Lord, I know something's coming. I need your protection desperately. I don't know when it is. I don't know when it's coming. I don't know. But Lord, protect me in these areas. Keep me in prayer constantly. Guard my mouth. Guard my heart from wicked thoughts and deeds and from the influence of wicked men. Train me to gracefully accept reproof, which came in very handy with David when um, the prophet Nathan said, Thou art the man. I'm sure he thought of this psalm. If he didn't write it after the fact, I'm sure if he wrote it before, he thought of him writing these words when Nathan said, Thou art the man. Train me to gracefully accept reproof. Let the Lord take care of vengeance and let me, Lord, only trust in you and not in men. When we do Good, when we grow, inevitably, inevitably, there's a trial coming. There's something coming. And simply, is that because God wants to hurt us? Is that because God wants to just instantly like, well, he's doing good, but wait till what's around the corner? No, that's not how God is. He's a loving father, and when we begin to grow, he says, okay, I'm going to test it a little bit more. And does he send the troubles and trials into our lives? No, he allows them to happen, to grow us. He wants to perfect you, as James says, to make you a better follower of Him. Each day, we're to grow in our Christian walk. There is no plateau. We can't afford to plateau. We have to keep growing every single day in the area of prayer. Every single day in these many different areas, we have to be growing constantly. And as we live this life, there will be trials but we better be prepared for these trials. To be better prepared for these trials, we must beg God to protect us in the same ways that David did here. I don't know about you, but I'd love it if I could say that I could keep the spirit of revival that I've got gained over these last, this last week, if I could keep that all the way until next year's revival. I would love that. I've had periods of time in my life where, where it feels like You're so on fire, and you can keep that for a long period of time, but the only way to maintain it is to consistently beg God. Is to consistently not only beg God to maintain it, but to shore up the areas where we might be weak. And if you if you look at what David said, it pretty much encompasses just about all of Christianity, doesn't it? But David's asking, pleading with the Lord, and we can't afford to have a time in our life where we're not begging God, God, I don't know what's coming. I don't know what tomorrow will bring. I can't afford to have a time where I sit idle because what will happen is 
Something's going to blindside us. Something's going to come out of nowhere. And if we're ready for it, we can defend against it. But if we're not, it's going to knock us. It's going to knock us back. And it takes a while to get back up, doesn't it? So tonight the challenge is simply this. If we want to keep that spirit of revival, the most earnest thing that we can pray for is, Lord, protect me. Protect me every day. Lord, be, is to get more fervent in our prayer life so that God, and plead for God to do these things. Be more fervent in our prayer life. Watch what we say. Guard our hearts. And not just trying to do it of our own will, but begging God to give us the power and the grace to do that. We want to be better, for these, better prepared for these trials. We must beg God to protect us and guard our hearts. Tonight, I just want to challenge us. If, if you're on fire as much as I am from this past week's revival, we have to ask God, beg God, Lord, if I want to keep this, I need you to protect me. I need you to preserve that spirit in my heart so that I can go do my real job, so that I can encourage the brethren, so that we can grow as a church. All those things that Pastor went through over the separate nights, so that we can continue in those things, we need to beg God, Lord, preserve us. Keep us and protect us as we continue to grow and do your will. Dear Lord, I thank you so much tonight for your word and just for the way that it speaks to us every single day. Lord, I, Lord I'm on fire for you once again, Lord. And I, I pray, Lord, that you'd keep it, that you'd help us to fervently seek after you to keep that spirit of revival, to keep that alive. But Lord, I can't afford to be idle. I can't afford to sit and plateau. I can't. Lord, I pray tonight, I beg you, Lord, I pray that you would protect my heart. There is way too much to lose to not beg you to protect my heart from wickedness, Lord, to protect my heart from these, these many things that David even listed here, Lord. I pray that you would be with us tonight. Help us to plead with you our cause, Lord, and I pray, Lord, that you would be with us every single day and protect us and guard us with your word. We love you, Lord. Thank you for all you do for us. In Jesus' name, amen.